one inch high figure in the painted on business suit stood on the edge of a railway platform, tapping its clockwork toes as it waited. The others in the queue behind it buzzed slightly to themselves. Finally, an impeccable naught gauge replica of a 1920 steam locomotive whirred and clattered its way up to the station, pulling three custom made Pullman cars behind it. The miniature men stood patiently as the train came to rest, shuffled a bit while the line of other figures filed out of the cars and finally trooped onto the train in unison before settling themselves neatly into their seats. Behind the station, the doctor's face leaned in close, soft blue eyes peering for a moment at the expressions on the tiny mechanical faces. Every sculpted hair on their heads was perfectly in place, not like his own chestnut curls at all. He then straightened up and gently turned one of the dozens of handles on the control board, sending the train's wheels rattling into motion and sighed. He felt glum. The model train set in front of him was a miracle of craftsmanship. His own craftsmanship, actually. Built over the course of many years, a lifetime ago. More than a dozen trains of all varieties, electrics, steamers, even an old Mickey Mouse hand car, circle between five stations across miles of carefully crafted countryside. A miniature river bubbled from a source in paper mache mountains and ran under half dozen bridges of increasing size, ending in a glittering lake by the shoreline terminus. And the people had been his crown and glory, the product of months of tinkering in his workshop and further months of painstakingly hand detailing the painted faces on each one. The resulting world stretched from wall to wall in his wood panelled study and was guaranteed to make the eyes of anyone who saw it widen in amazement. So what was it missing now? He'd always loved trains, for as long as he could remember. Even as a little boy, he dreamed of driving one. Sometimes he looked at the dream in a different way. At one point in his life, he would much rather have been the station master, quietly tending his plot and keeping his corner the larger system in order. While at other times he would gladly have just been the man who rescued damsels from bits of railway line which men with curled moustaches kept tying them with alarming regularity. He suspected that one of his more recent incarnations would have rather have been one of the steam engines, all brightly painted in gaudy brass, huffing and puffing and chuffing about with great noise and clatter. But most recently, he tended towards being the man in the nerve centre, rooting and switching the trains on all their myriad of ways each one playing their part in the larger tapestry of schedules and goals. This was the doctor who had built the model train layout, who had machined each engine and laid each piece of track, who took a craftsman's pride in knowing every quirk and foible of the system he had engineered. He set each train on its way and happily juggled the dozens of minute details needed to keep them from interfering with each other. His pleasure came in the sight of a crisis overcome, or even better, a potential crisis avoided. He was the man who developed a childlike grin at the sight of the whole bustling network running smoothly. Finally, he'd come up with a plan in which everything worked. No matter what else you could say about him, he made the trains run on time. But now the new doctor looked at the model train set with a vaguely dissatisfied frown. It was all very well having a system which responded precisely to what you told it to do. But where was the surprise in that? If he prodded the rail network, he knew instinctively which way it would jump, but it would never jump on its own. Why didn't anything happen without him telling it to? The miniature landscape required his constant attention to keep functioning. If he stepped away from it, would his mind wander? It either froze into immobility or collapsed into collisions and derailments. It was beginning to feel like such a bother, having to take care of every last detail. Why couldn't he just have the system, just handle things on its own? And so that is what he did. With a sudden burst of energy, he dashed off to the TARDIS workshop, a long, low room smelling of damp and machine oil. He hunted through the rows of hulking metal machines till he found what he was looking for, an ancient computer terminal tucked in a corner behind a lathe and an IC press. He pulled up a chair and set about imagining. His first creation was a locomotive which laid its own track in front of it 
and pulled it up behind, letting it wander about free on the floor like a gerbil in a plastic ball. This was an entirely successful, while having an electric train nuzzling his feet as he worked the console was definitely a fascinating new sensation. His enjoyment was curtailed the day the train bolted down the TARDIS corridors as fast as its little wheels could carry it, never to be seen again. It was bound to make a break for freedom one day, he mused, and went back to his workshop. This time he brought a passenger with him for inspiration. The tiny woman in the suit of paint stood on top of the terminal's monitor, politely but pointedly looking at her watch every few minutes as she waited for the train to arrive from somewhere. Programming this into them had been a matter of minutes. He'd just given the passengers the desire to constantly be somewhere that they weren't. It was a simple drive, and one that he was quite familiar with himself. But what else might he be capable of doing? For the next two days, he worked at the computer. Occasionally, he remembered to sleep or eat. Then he dropped his coat, rolled up his sleeves, and warmed up the furnace. He spent the next few days die casting and assembling and painting, piecing together intricate clockwork while the IC press stamped out tiny silicon wafers like rows of gingerbread men. He returned to the layout and drove all the trains back to the rail yard. He picked up each of the passengers as they milled about on the platforms and placed them carefully into a large hat box. Then he leaned over the main terminal on the centre line and began taking the track apart. Within a few minutes, all the rail beds and layouts were bare. Only the main rail yard remained. Then he carefully disassembled the bridges, reducing them to a pile of beams, leaving the station standing alone. Then he left the room, ignoring for the moment the confused shuffling and bumping coming from inside the hatbox. He returned an hour or two later, pushing a wheelbarrow full of earth fresh from one of the agricultural areas of the TARDIS. He dived into his next task. With a trowel, he began spreading half an inch of the soil over the entire landscape. By the time he started coating the mountains, he noted with glee the tiny shoots had already begun to sprout in the lowlands. Those miracle grow seeds that Captain Indians had sold him were turning out to be great value after all. Pretty soon, the entire countryside would be covered with a fine carpet of not scaled grass. Real soil over the paper mache. Real grass over the green paint. He stepped back for a moment, admiring his handiwork. Then he dashed out of the room again to return with another box bumping and rattling under his arm. He opened up the new box and let the clockwork men march out. This new batch of people were painted in work clothes, toy soldiers with shovels and scrapers clustering around the end of the track at the edge of the rail yard. Two of the men in the lead set up miniature surveyor's tripods and quickly took a series of sightings in the direction of the central line terminal. The other two men stood motionless, tiny positronic processors in their die-cast heads, shuttering silently over their wireless network. The doctor suddenly realised he was holding his breath. Then as if a switch had been thrown, the group scattered. Most of them hustled over to the ground in front of the last piece of track and started shoveling and smoothing and grading the soil. Half a dozen others clambered over the pile of track and began to ease a piece off the top, lowering it to the ground and carrying it with a jerky clockwork steps over to the beginning of the line. They fitted it into place and marched back for another, while the crew ahead of them busily cleared the way forward. The doctor watched them, his eyes wide with awe. He stared rapidly as they reached the central line terminal, as the surveyors took a new batch of sightings, and the crew worked and split in half. One crew headed down the path to the old central line, while the other curved away onto a new route towards the mountains. More workers, who had been waiting patiently by the rail yard, hurried over, joined the crews, lugging a set of points with them. The doctor couldn't help it. His face split into a wide grin. He tore himself away from the sight of the crew and let his hands flutter over the trains and the rail yard. Which to do first? He lifted one locomotive, a replica of a New York Central Commodore Vanderbilt, out of the rail yard and dashed from the room with it. When he returned, several hours later, the locomotive didn't look any different from the outside. He'd very carefully hidden 
all of the additional wires and control circuitry beneath the surface. She replaced the engine in the roundhouse and couldn't resist waving his fingers at the inch-tall figure now standing in the locomotive's cab. Aside from his blue and white engineer's cap, the young blonde mechanical man was dressed in an outfit vaguely like that of an Edwardian cricketer. For the next two days he'd made these changes, one locomotive at a time. Finally he'd replaced the last one, the Mickey Mouse handcar, on the track and leaned back to look at the layout. It was amazing. While he'd been working, the builders had woven all the stations together into a web of shining tracks. Some of the lines followed the same paths he'd laid before, but others took shortcuts that he'd never dreamed of. They'd run track up to the top of the mountain and crisscrossed the river with four bridges of their own design. They'd even started work on a spur line leading off the table and were industriously building a suspension bridge over the nearest bookshelf. It was ready, at last. He looked down, surprised. The hat box wasn't where he'd left it. Then he saw that the Brownian movement of the passengers bumping against the wall of the hat box caused the box to inch several feet across the floor. He caught it, picked it up, and poured the much-delayed passengers onto the central line terminus platform. They shuffled themselves upright and began to form orderly queues. The doctor took his seat and cranked the main transformer's output up to full. The little men at the controls of the Amtrak Metroliner checked the signals and, with a whir and a rattle, pulled his train out onto the central line. The doctor barely moved a blink for the next three hours. It took him that long to get even a glimpse of the marvellous, complex rhythm the clockwork men had fallen into. The trains crisscrossed and outtraced each other, dodging each other partly through careful scheduling and partly through fast reflexes and luck. One train could meander from the mountains to the shore like a wandering thought, or a streak from the central to the rural whistle stop at the far edge at 30 seconds flat. The trains played nice, following the signals, got out of the way when one of them was in a hurry, and even in 10 minutes, an express ran out of the bookshelf line and onto the new depot that they set up by war and peace. The doctor closed his eyes and listened to the ebb and flow, the rattle of the wheels clattering over the soft hum of the TARDIS itself. Finally, he took control of the 1920s New York electric commuter train and sent it weaving throughout the layout, his own trail dodging and zooming among the gorgeous shifting complexity swirling around him. <laughs> he was grinning like that other six-year-old he'd been centuries ago. The waves of motion which surrounded him were astounding and the details of each piece in motion were mesmerizing. And the doctor looked at the model train set and saw it was good. He set it up, he let it go, and it became something greater than he could have ever done on his own. I thought I could, the doctor chuckled to himself. I thought I could. Then one thing led to another, as things tend to do. And after a while, the doctor went away. It was just for a little adventure outside the TARDIS, a chance to wander through a world that was much larger than he was. When he was finished, letting the waves of the world's motion wash over him, he went back to his study. He stared in disbelief. Engines and cars lay strewn across tracks, in the river, in a pile on the floor between the layout and the bookshelf. A lone digger wandered in circles, his pick jerking up and down in front of him, sparks arcing where his head had been. The Raymond Lurie steam line engine had somehow embedded itself nose first in the paper mache mountain. As he'd watched the last surviving train, the little Mickey Mouse handcar, trundled up to the spot where the southern river bridge had once stood and fell into the river with a plop. The doctor collapsed onto the chair in front of the layout. How could this have happened? A few scattered passengers were still standing, unawares of the surviving platforms. Dear heavens, they hadn't even realized what was happening as it happened. His head slowly shook back and forth, his jaw hanging slack. As far as he could reconstruct, it had begun when a group of passengers, impatient at waiting for trains, had set out across the countryside on foot. <laughs> 
One of them was hit by the Union Pacific Express and got caught between its wheels, causing a spectacular derailment, which took out the entire central line. As the rail workers struggled valiantly to move the toppled cars, which weighed hundreds of times more than they did, the knock-on delays caused more passengers to abandon the platforms. Another group of passengers picked up tools and started to lay track themselves, unthinkingly, as if they were mere presence of disconnected strength of rails would cause a train to appear on it. They built their track bed straight towards their destination without regard for the rest of the rail lines. And when they laid their new tracks directly across the north spur of the mountain line, the next catastrophe was inevitable. With two lines out of service and every train running late, the fabric of agreement and compromise which held the system together began to unravel. Engineers started cutting each other off at points or gunned the motors to make time. The Raymond Laurie steam line jumped the rails on a curve and plowed into the rural whistle stop, demolishing the balsa wood shelter and crushing the waiting passengers under wheel. The 1920s New York electric commuter train, unable to slow down in time, broadsided an arthritic freight train at a set of points. Two engines were left waiting on the bookshelf line bridge, which gave way under the sustained weight. The civilian construction gang kept laying their line until they reached the river, at which point they blithely stepped in and got swept away by the current. It must have been only a few more minutes before the end, when the Commodore Vanderbilt and the Metroliner met head-on on the Southern River Bridge and demolished the whole thing. The doctor sat in front of the layout and put his head in his hands. He should have known better. You have to watch these things. You can't let them get out of control. He should have known better. If you give them a chance to grow on their own, they're bound to bring things crashing down around them. Look what happened with the human's transit system. He should have known better. He had known better back when he first built the layout, when he was so much older then. He really didn't want to be that old again. He picked up the headless digger and, with a merciful squeeze of a thumb and finger, he switched it off. You can't mend people, he remembered a voice saying. He spent so much of his time trying to do just that, keeping the little worlds from tumbling into chaos when they didn't know how to cope with the running themselves helping them learn how to put the pieces of themselves back together. But somehow, all his work ever did was make them depend on him more and more, make it more and more impossible for them to go on without him. The rails he was on always led him back to the same place again. It would never change. Then he spotted the work crew, they were standing, clustered, where the bridge of the bookshelf had stood. They were reeling out a spool of thread they'd found somewhere off the edge of the table. They leaned across to look over the edge. They were lowering a man on the end of a thread. The doctor watched. The man found his feet on the floor, walked over to the remains of the fallen bridge, and grabbed one beam. The work party up on the layout then began to hoist him back up. A pile of beams they'd already retrieved stood next to them. Other workers were starting to maneuver a few of them back into position, putting the bridge back into place. A couple of surveyors, the work done, were moving on towards the remains of the river bridge. The doctor watched them for a long time. Then he got down on the floor to help them. He started to pick up the remains of the bridge for them, but stopped. Leave that to them. Instead, he helped them pick up the cars. Who knows? Given enough time, they might be able to figure out a way to shift the trains on their own. But he might as well give them a hand and save them a few years. He shrugged, smiled, and started setting the cars back upright on the tracks. He'd be going away again soon, for some time. And the further along they were, the better. You never know. They might just learn this time.